So the US tried to get North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons, mainly through pressure and sanctions. But that approach has backfired. It has actually hardened Pyongyang's resolve to hone its nuclear and missile technology. North Korea has said the only way that it will give up its nuclear weapons is if the US, quote, abandons its hostile policy. In other words, take reciprocal steps towards arms reduction. But that is presumably the last thing that Washington wants to do. So now here comes Joe Biden, and how will his team resolve this dilemma? So what is that saying? You know, the definition of insanity, if you repeat the same failed approach and expect different results. <laughs> um, I think that Biden's advisors are at least in consensus that the all or nothing approach, meaning demanding that North Korea give up all its weapons all at once. That was the approach of John Bolton and that has failed. So at least there is that recognition. So instead, the catchword now is arms control approach. What this means is first, let's freeze North Korea's plutonium and uranium nuclear operations. And then after that, we'll see what happens. Let's take incremental steps toward the ultimate goal of complete unilateral denuclearization. So this is the preferred approach of Secretary of State nominee Tony Blinken. Um, he advocates an interim deal, cap North Korea's nuclear weapons, buy time to work out a long-term agreement down the road. And then he says we should get allies and also China on board to pressure North Korea quote unquote, squeeze North Korea to get it to the negotiating table. Quote, we need to cut off its various avenues and access to resources. He advocates telling countries with North Korean guest workers, send them home. And then he says, if China won't cooperate, then threaten China with more forward deployed missile defense and military exercises. I think that this is no different from the failed approach of the past. It was still a policy of pressure, isolation, and the goal still is unilaterally disarming North Korea. Excuse me, I think somebody has uh, needs to mute. <laughs> Thank you. That's Victor here. There. Okay. Only difference is that the Biden administration is willing to take more time to get to the ultimate goal, but it's still the same approach, still the same goal. In this case, North Korea will probably continue to press forward on its nuclear weapons and missile capability. So unless the US drastically shifts position, I think renewed tension between the US and North Korea is, will eventually happen. It's a question of if, uh, of if not when. Um, uh, the other way around, it's a question of when, not if. So instead of focusing on how to get North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons, asking how to get to permanent peace in Korea would lead us to a different, more fundamental set of answers. Because then we will realize that actually all parties, not just North Korea, have a responsibility to take steps towards mutual arms reduction. As we know, the US still has 28,000 troops in South Korea. Until recently, they regularly conducted massive war exercises that included plans for preemptive strikes on North Korea. They have included flying B-2 bombers, which are the bombers that drop nuclear bombs. And do you know how much it costs to fly a B-2 bomber? $130,000 an hour to fly a B-2 bomber, just for one hour. So um, the US and South Korea had scaled back these exercises since the summit in 2018. Um, however, recently, the commander of US forces in Korea has, has, ad, has called for the resumption of these large scale joint war drills. And if the Biden administration decides to move ahead with these war drills, which is scheduled for March, 
it would actually renew very dangerous military tension on the Korean Peninsula. It would harm any chance for diplomatic engagement with North Korea in the near future. Um, so, to re just to close out, to reduce the threat of nuclear war with North Korea, and also to preserve the option of resuming talks in the future, the Biden administration should actually do two things in the first 100 days. One, continue the suspension of the large-scale U.S.-South Korean joint war drills. And during the q and I can talk more about um, a specific campaign to do that. And then the second thing is they need to start a strategic review of North Korea policy that begins with the question, how do we get to permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula? And I would say a very important part of that is ending the Korean War that has been unresolved for seven years, replacing the armistice with a permanent peace agreement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, those are excellent uh, actions that we can take. And I know that uh, Congressman Ro Khanna said he would be reintroducing his resolution to declare a formal end of the Korean War. So we'll be awaiting that and supporting that as well. And please feel free to post anything you want in the chat that you want people to follow up on. Thank you again. Uh, Medea, would you like to introduce Jody? I think you know her. Yes, uh, thank you, Henley. That was beautiful. And um, I hope we get a chance to have questions um, because I, I think what you uh, bring up is just uh, so important to figure out how we can do best to push the Biden administration to be better on this issue and allow the North and South to establish their own uh, uh, pathways to peace, which unfortunately the U.S. has been uh, an obstacle to. And uh, Jody, um, well, Jody is my uh, dear sister for uh, several decades now. I don't think there's a day that goes by when I don't talk to her about 20 or 30 times uh, and is constantly amazing me with her new ideas and brilliance. And on top of all the other things that she uh, is doing, she started this China is not our enemy campaign at Code Pink. And in full Judy, Jody style, uh, it is a campaign that uh, not only uh, educates people with weekly webinars that are just beautiful, and you can go to the Code Pink YouTube channel and find a series of fantastic webinars with the greatest guests, but also comes up with an action every single week for people to do. Uh, and so it's quite astounding and beautiful how you're growing this list of people who want to be involved in this campaign, uh, China's Not Our Enemy. So thank you, Jody, and take it away. I think, I think you're, uh, do we have to unmute her? Unmute her? She should be able to. I unmute. Yeah, I think you're unmute. Oh. Thanks, Medea. I'm so excited that you're my partner. I'm blessed. Um, and Hanli, thank you. Uh, I, I avoid talking about North Korea in my presentation because uh, it is you know, key for a long time to China, North Korea. And I think people don't know that 300,000 Chinese lost their lives in the, in the Korean War, which was the US war on Korea. China did not want to be at war. So um, there's, you know, it too has a deep history. Anyway, in April of 2018, my husband moved to China, uh, which meant that I was in China every month until January of this year. On January 30th, I flew from New York City to LA instead of New York City to Shanghai. And it is through this lens that I've been watching the hate and lies escalate towards China. Of course, I had my eye on Hong Kong. I knew it was complex. But I also knew from my time in China that most of those 1.4 billion people um, who are Chinese um, believed that Hong Kong was stolen from them by the British. And they suffered the opium wards, which besieged their country, and they feel it painfully, shamefully, and painfully. And, you know, they're not going to let uh, U.S. get control of Hong Kong, which is what it wants, you know, it's Korea, Hong Kong, Afghanistan, which it's been trying to constantly get Taiwan, you know, where can its bases be uh, directed towards China? 
Um, so, you know, they could see in Hong Kong that US funding was going to amplify what was happening and people were out there with Trump signs and American flags. So you can imagine that it was unsettling to the Chinese in China and in Hong Kong. Um, and they were, there was, you know, from their point of view, it was a mess being made a lot by the United States engagement. And then I was watching the hate and lies grow with COVID. And it wasn't just Trump, but it was the US papers of record, the Washington Post and the New York, New York Times. And it began to feel like the Iraq war. I like called up Medina, I was like, this is the Iraq war all over again. You know, what I was reading and hearing had nothing to do with the facts. And the facts weren't even hidden. Um, you know, soon into the year, Vijay Prashad at the Tricontinental did a three-part dossier breaking it all down. But what you were reading in the media was just stories. Okay, what did Chinese do wrong about COVID? Uh, which is what, you know, keeps saying they, they messed up. There was no cover-up to the world. It was revealed to the World Health Organization in December by the first doctor who saw it and to grandparents of uh, and a child, uh, their grandchild. On January 1st, according to the US head of CDC, he got a call from the Chinese CDC telling him there was a strange and a communicative disease that attacks the lungs. We know this from the New York Times because the US CDC guy said the China guy called crying. So yes, there was a cover-up, but it was in China. It was a three-day cover-up as they worked to put a plan in place to protect the people. Just announcing it would have caused pandemonium. When they announced it, it had a plan. I think the Chinese pandemonium would have looked not as silly as people stocking up on toilet paper though. But anyway, so um, why were lies being fished out of the story and spread by the US papers? Why attack China when it did everything right? When the WHO is praising it for locating and segmenting the disease faster than any pandemic? If you wanna point a finger at China, it should be how to do it right. Governments from surrounding countries were immediately offered what was needed to create plans for their countries the losses around China are low, and 5,000 is the number of lives lost in China, a country of 1.4 billion. All the new cases are brought in from the outside. And recently, as we read in The Guardian, I think it was yesterday, more and more is being revealed that it existed in Italy and France in all the way back to September. Um, so it didn't even maybe originate in China. Um, so it was January 30th when I didn't get on my flight because I didn't want to be quarantined into China. I was talking to my husband every night about the experience. He lives in two communities, one in Shanghai and one in Sanya. He's Jamaican and there's an island in China. So he, he goes there when he needs his Jamaica hit. And um, each one was different and they were each created out of the neighborhoods. So I think few people in the United States know that politics in China is local. I would venture to say that it's more democratic than US because democracy is not about voting. It's about the community coming together, voicing its needs, working together, finding solutions. Um, so now my husband, he goes to dinner with 18, works in an office with 40, goes to parties while I remain in, in the quarantine I was avoiding. So there were a few, those are a few points that Marcy wanted me to address, but um, given the nine months that I've been working on this China's Not Our Enemy campaign, we've been building and working within coalitions on the issue, one globally, um, it's called No Cold War. One is in the grassroots movement, it includes Pivot for Peace and the Chow Collective, two organizations that have grown out of the need to stop the war on China, and our um, China Advocacy Collective in DC, and at the core of the problem is the narratives we get caught up in and make decisions from. And I even noticed in Marcy's questions that even our questions are inside the state department <laughs> narratives. I'm watching the learning curve with the crew in DC and, and it's like they're starting to catch themselves, but we, we forget that like we're inside of this bubble of a, a narrative that's created for us. And what's cool about it is that you know, once you figure it out, 
it's easy to debunk their stories by pulling out facts. Um, Cold War, this is the US war on China. It is not a Cold War with China. Uh, it wasn't a Cold War on Russia. It, with Russia, it was a Cold War on Russia. But um, this is US aggression and already a hybrid war on China. It was a US war on Korea. It was a US war on Vietnam. It was a US war on Iraq. China wants peace with the US. It is not imperialist. It knows the costs of wars. They have been very recent. It almost destroyed a 5,000 year old country. War is something that's very real to the Chinese people. I just want to remind everybody that China was one of the four, four poorest countries in the world in the 60s and 70s. But also I want to let you know that in the 1800s, Beijing was the biggest city in the world and China had the highest GDP. It was then that England wanted to colonize China. It had fully plundered India and was making its way to China. And that's when it first attacked Afghanistan. So this story goes way back and it pulls in a lot of stories that we're engaged with that I don't think many of us have unraveled. We have to see the big picture um, as they're going to try to bring us to fight on their narratives of little stories. We have to keep pulling the narrative back. And it is, it is complex and it's a big picture. It has, it's about a history of imperialism. And as we pull back the curtain, much can be revealed. For Asian Americans, the racism that is centuries deep will be painful, but not news. The narrative is ours to change and to rewrite the story. We have to be on the offensive, not on the defensive. Other Marcy's requests were about the trade war. You know, China made a decision to invest a huge in technology and raising productivity but they want to share it with the workers. Um, so they knew if they needed to increase wages, they've increased social protections and insurance and all kinds of things for workers. And they say they did it because um, they were listening to Henry Ford, um, who said that you can't um, start making cars if you're not paying the workers enough to buy them, which is kind of how the US worked until for 70 years until Reagan and the 80s and 90s and the US went global. But trade's not my issue. If you want to hear more about trade, um, I did a webinar with John Cavana from Institute for Policy Studies. My favorite quote from that was John said, Chinese workers didn't steal your jobs, GM did. So if you want to learn more about trade in China, check that webinar out. Another thing Marcy asked was about accusations of curiosity, manipulation, expulsion of journalists, and consulate closures. All those things are in their narrative. Those are reactions to US aggression. China has met every push by the US with a pushback, except in things like the arresting of Meng Wanzhou, the chief financial officer at, at Huawei. They arrested her in Canada. That was an outlandish illegal act and no one in the world is holding the US accountable. Stealing TikTok and WeChat under conditions that no other country would take lying down all from lies and accusations that are unfounded. It's kind of like Obama's red line with Syria, but the attacks like in Iran and Venezuela are all in the world of finance, the new war zone. It is like what happens in the streets of the US and Palestine. Power does what it wants with no repercussions. Hell, Biden got to be cheerleader for the Iraq war cost the US hundreds of thousands of casualties and billions of dollars and no accountability, just rewards. Now he's president. Oh, and just a reminder, it is the US that has China surrounded by hundreds of US bases, 50 of which are large bases, plus the US 7 fleet. And the US has installed anti-missile systems in Taiwan and South Korea. I could go on about how the US is the aggressor, but, um, I want to come back to the narrative. We have to change the narrative. We can't get stuck in the he said, she said, that will just go back and forth. Our narrative, war with China is bad, unnecessary, and imperialism. The end is nuclear war and a nuclear winter, which means nothing grows and we are toast. The US needs to learn how to compete and cooperate. 
not drive war. We know, like with Iraq, this will engage the entire region. How do you think Taiwan feels? They will be used by the US to get to China, just like Hong Kong. So it will be an entire region affected. Right now, we need money flowing to the needs of people, not new high-tech weapons and plans to destroy the Chinese fleet in 72 hours. Um, certainly, we don't need to be brought to the brink of nuclear war, but I leave that to Molly to talk about more. In response to Uyghurs and Hong Kong, I don't think people realize that when the U.S. creates military buildup, it can only force China, as it has in other um, administrations and other countries, to move into protection. That protection is going to be worse for Uyghurs and Hong Kong. They will be in protective mode. Both those places are where the U.S. wants to weaken China. It, you know, this will cause both countries to spend a lot of money, but not just China and the U.S. because the U.S. will pull in more and China will pull in more. And what we have is another rape of resources away from the needs of people, lining the pockets of the military industrial complexes with no good end. Our narrative, this is racist. This is driving xenophobia. Asian high cr hate crimes are up 800%. All the hate and lies that are being driven are that, hate and lies, vile hate and lies. We need to help pull back the narrative and talk about what is happening to human beings. That includes Biden, who bullied China just two weeks ago. All the way China failed to on COVID, all the way the US has failed on COVID. Still with the lies and cheap talking points, the New York Times con continues with them. But we delivered over 5,000 signatures to Kamala Harris telling her to back down Biden just two Mondays ago. It was that Wednesday and the New York Time not Times noted that she was silent. We have to keep on her so that she can go after the Biden administration and pull them back. Kamala has a Chinese name. She's the first Asian American vice president. We must keep the pressure on. I'll post um, links in the comments after I'm done of ways you can engage with Kamala. And also um, at the racist tweet by Senator Marsha Blackburn that we've been taking down this week. Um, already 2,000 people have sent emails to um, Marsha Blackburn telling her to take down her tweet and apologize to Asian Americans. Okay our narrative caring state or callous state china just eradicated extreme poverty taking 900 million out of poverty i live in a city of 15,000 homeless we as a global people need to be in cooperation learning from each other and connecting not driving war this is imperialism greed and it's at the expense of all the people on the planet there is healthcare to address, climate chaos, and the migrant nations it will be producing soon. World resources need to be directed to caring for the people on the planet. So get to know China. Don't be used by their narrative. It's the State Department narrative. Which side are you on? Is it about capitalism or communism? Or is it about care and callousness? Don't get stuck, stuck quieted by the Red Scare that they'll definitely be using. This is about peace and love against lies and hate. You can feel it when you're in it. Find which side you're on and you'll have a ground to stand on. We have a website full of webinars and articles and stories. There's a collective in China supplying us with weekly insights into the news of China called the Dongfeng Collective. And in the next month, they're gonna start giving us insight into the political discourse and what that looks like in China and what they're having arguments about. Um, we'll learn their form of engaged democracy as they take on big issues, issues that are so familiar to ours. So from the Chinese point of view, this is blaming the victim. China is not the protagonist in this. Learn the history, theirs and ours. And um, please engage. If you engage in any of the actions I post, then you'll be invited to engage in the ones I post every week. It is going to be up to us to change this narrative. And thanks for all you do for peace. Thank you, Jody. Um, we look forward to whatever you want to post in the chat so people can follow up with you. Really appreciate uh, what you had to say. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, David Swanson. David, uh, I've known David for, I don't know, over a decade. He's phenomenal. 
wonderful thinker, brilliant thinker. He's an author, activist, journalist, and radio host. He's the executive director of World Beyond War. We'll also be hearing from Leah Bolger, president of World Beyond War, in a moment. Uh, David is the campaign coordinator for RootsAction.org. I'm sure you've seen their petitions. Uh, he's written a number of books, including War is a Lie and When the, war, when the World Outlawed War. David blogs at davidswanson.org. You can follow him there. Also at warisacrime.org. David Swanson hosts Talk Nation Radio. He recently interviewed Medea and myself on uh, Michelle Flournoy and other foreign policy issues. And David is a Nobel Peace Prize nominee. He was awarded the 2018 Peace Prize by the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation. David, take it away. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, terrific job you're doing with these calls. Thank you, Medea. Um, wonderful remarks by Hugh and Lee and by Jody. Uh, I think I would learn more by skipping my turn here, but I'll, I'll try to talk briefly. Um, uh, Leah Bolger, who's going to be speaking soon, I think, is the is the president of the board of, of the group that I'm the director of, World Beyond War, which we started several years ago now to try to create something global uh, to go after the whole institution uh, of militarism with, with educational work and with activist work, um, and that's what we've been trying to do. So we have chapters in Canada, for example, that have been working on uh, on trying to, to free Meng Wanzhou uh, and getting a lot of heat in, in Canada for pushing that um, there. Um, but we are forming chapters and there are chapters that you can join in uh, increasingly in all parts of the world. Um, we also are doing endless uh, webinars now um, and uh, I, I think we all need to be taking more advantage uh, of doing this globally. Uh, there's no reason we can't have people from China, from Korea, from any part of the world uh, on these uh, online events with us. Uh, and it's, it's just wonderful when we do have people from all over the world talking together as a community of, of peace activists. Uh, it's very encouraging. Um, some of the local campaigns that chapters are working on, in addition to closing bases, which is Leah's topic, uh, are divestment uh, and demilitarizing police forces. Uh, so we're working on, on those and other uh, particular campaigns that you can find on worldbeyondwar.org. Uh, on this topic of, of China and a Cold War, um, and I think there is this problem of a Cold War with Russia as well. I, I think the first thing we have to do is, is cure exceptionalism. The, and I wrote a book a year or so ago called Curing Exceptionalism. I, I, the idea that anyone would fault China for failing at something, speaking from the United States, that you would fault anyone on earth for failing at anything, from the United States is, is, you know, the great absurdity that we have to question. Uh, and, and we have to cure competitiveness. This notion that you can talk about some country as, as a corporate competitor, an economic competitor slash a military enemy uh, is just madness. Um, and we have to stop letting someone designate for us these, these enemies and these competitors. Uh, we also have to stop imagining that bombing people can somehow provide them with greater rights. You know, I mean, we don't have to prove that China's not doing anything wrong. We have to reject the absurd idea that anybody is helped by threats and attacks. Uh, we have to stop imagining that other nations arming themselves somehow threatens our rights, that China is going to take away our freedoms. Uh, I, I think we have to recognize that we're being played for suckers, that we're being lied to, uh, that China and Russia simply make much more profitable enemies for weapons dealers than does terrorism. Uh, and so this is the need to, for the Asia pivot. Um, and, and it would be so easy to get a reverse arms race going. There is no question that if the United States scaled back the teeniest bit rather than continually upping the military spending and the bases and the ships, that China would follow suit. Uh, but it has to be given that chance. 
Um, so I, I, I wrote a couple days ago and I put the link in the chat earlier and I sent to Marcy proposing what I might talk about, uh, an article called 27 Things You Can Do. Uh, and I've mentioned a few of them in passing already and I'll try to mention a few more, but not, not, uh, not nearly the, the whole list. You can go to the link, the link in the chat. Um, but one thing we can we can do uh, is to raise awareness of the nuclear danger, uh, shifting shifting the threats and provocations and basing and and weapons building to uh, a nuclear enemy is a whole different uh, danger uh, from making terrorism the focus uh, and. There is going to be a wonderful day for education and activism and agitation and celebration on January 22nd when nuclear weapons become illegal in 50 plus nations uh, and we push other nations to do the same. Uh, so you can go to worldbeyondwar.org 122, meaning January 22nd, and find a, a large and growing toolkit of things to use on that date. Uh, you can also find, uh, as one of the 27 things, uh, a, a form to email your Congress members, your senators and misrepresentatives in Washington on, on getting out of the way and letting Korea make peace. Um, the, the, the things that happened in Washington this past uh, you know, era, this past regime that's on the way out, that, that really struck me uh, in terms of, of power arrangements were number one, that, that Congress finally used the war powers resolution and ended a war, but it was vetoed. Uh, and that Congress now has, it has adopted this, this habit of forbidding presidents to end wars. So you can't take troops out of Korea, which hadn't even been proposed as far as I know. You can't take troops out of Afghanistan. You can't take troops out of Germany. That would be, you know, merely 75 years. It's too reckless and rushed. Uh, but this is, this is insane to have Congress forbidding the ending of wars. Uh, so we, we really need to focus on repeating that ending of the war on Yemen and saying what's next, Afghanistan, Syria, which ones can we proceed to end one by one? and undoing this, this notion that Congress can forbid ending a war. Um, one of the items that I had in this list that I think Marcy put in the, in the agenda as what I was talking about was the Green New Deal. And the reason I mentioned the Green New Deal is, is that it's the best opportunity we've got to get any money out of militarism. And getting any money out of militarism is the best chance that a Green New Deal has uh, of doing anything significant, uh, because that's where the money is. Um, and, you know, we couldn't get 10% out of militarism during a deadly pandemic to move it to opposing the deadly pandemic. This is, this is how entrenched that spending is. But if something's going to pass, that's going to be called a Green New Deal or something like it, uh, and we can get uh, not just Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, but the whole Congress to understand that they need the military money. Uh, and we can move some of that money as part of that deal to some sane foreign policy as well as domestic policy initiatives. We just might get a few dollars uh, out of the military budget. Um, another thing I think we need to do is, is get Congresswoman Lee and Congressman Pocan to tell us who's in the Military Budget Reduction Caucus and what it stands for uh, and start getting every member of Congress into it. Um, and, and I think the biggest enemy uh, in, in the Pentagon is not China, is not Russia, is not North Korea, is not Iran. It's it's having college like normal countries do. It's, it's making college part of public education. It's giving young people the choice uh, of getting an education instead of joining the killing machine. Uh, so we have to advance that. Um, but I think the early opportunity is gonna be on ending the war on Yemen. Uh, and I think we have to expand that not just to the practice of ending more wars, but to ending the weapons sales uh, and not just to Yemen. Um, but as in Congresswoman Ilhan Omar's bill, ending the weapons sales to all the human rights abusing 
nations, and then ending the insane notion that you can use war weapons without abusing human rights and ending foreign weapon sales uh, entirely. This is what we need to be moving toward. And Congresswoman Hart is going to introduce her package of seven peace-related bills again, but this time separately as seven separate occasions. Uh, and I think we should be uh, promoting each and every one of those. Uh, I, I think also on our list should be going after after Biden to end the sanctions on the National Criminal Court. You don't get more lawless than sanctioning the courts. Um, and, and of course, uh, having pushed back on Flournoy uh, and been part of a, a successful change there is terrific. We need a, we need a few more of those uh, in the coming weeks. There aren't there aren't any good ones. Uh, we we shouldn't be standing for for near a Tandon or or any of the war mad uh, nominees that are in front of us. So uh, this list goes on and on. I'll I'll stop and and save the rest for conversation and get to another speaker. Thanks, Marcy. Thank you, David. Wonderful to have all of you participating. Uh, I'm learning a lot. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, I believe uh, Hania. Oh, no, excuse me. Medea, you're going to introduce Leah. No, that's Hania. Oh, I'm sorry. Hania is going to introduce Leah. I thought uh, Molly. I'm Molly. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I will introduce yes. Leah. I can introduce myself if you want. Uh, it's probably the easiest. <laughs> Leah, I would love to introduce you, but I'll, I'll pass it on to Medea. All right. Well, I, I just, uh, I'll start out just by saying that um, uh, it's been wonderful working with Leah in many capacities, uh, both at World uh, Beyond War and before that, the United for Peace and Justice, and uh, now with the fabulous work that you've been doing, Leah, about the U.S. bases. And um, I, I think that's such an important uh, component. And you as a veteran uh, know very well these issues and speak from a position of authority um, that many other people don't. And so maybe if uh, you, you give us a little bit of your background and then um, tell us about the, the uh, campaign to close U.S. bases. Great, I'm happy to do that. Thank you very much. Before um, before I get start my little presentation, um, I wanted to put a shout out to Code Pink because I was part of a delegation that went to Pakistan in 2012 uh, when I was the president of Veterans for Peace and it really changed my life. It changed my focus on, when you meet with people who are the real victims, firsthand victims of American war, uh, it's really a sobering thing and very, Enlightening. So whenever the travel eases up and, and we can travel again, um, if uh, Code Pink, I'm sure we'll be putting together more delegations, I highly recommend them. Um, Marcy, can you share, uh, give me power to share my screen? Oh, sure, sure, yes. Okay. Uh, here we go. Cool. All right. Okay. We're now in power. All right. All right. I think. Can you see? Uh, are you guys seeing my slide? I am not. Oh. You're co host, so you should be able to share your screen. Yeah, well, I'm, oh, I'm so sorry. This is so complicated. You know what? It's, know what it's a, it's share. A Oh, there we go. Oh, there you go. Yay. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So um, the first thing I want to tell you, oh, for Christ's sake, let's go in here. Okay. The first thing I want to tell you is um, here's a quote from the, um, the Pentagon strategic plane document. And they put it in black and white right there. They say right from the very beginning, the first sentence is that we are going to be competing with China and that they are an adversary. Uh, that is re-emerging, and we, we've got to focus our attention on them. The second little quote there is, um, is basically a military pablum to talk about anything the military does. Uh, pretty much fall into one of those categories. But the U.S. military needs their bases in order to carry out their policies. And um, this, this chart map you may have seen before. Um, sometimes it's startling for people to see this because 
He didn't realize that the American military has divided the whole world up to sections uh, uh, and, uh, by, ge by geography so we can better control them and command them. And so the, um, the sectors are North America, South America, Europe, uh, Central um, Asia, Africa, and Pacific uh, Command. And uh, actually, this is a little bit old chart because now they call it Indo-Pacific Com, indo -Com, to include the Indian Ocean. Um, but it basically, uh, we treat the world like a battlefield. And what's, what's even worse is now we treat the space as a battlefield. It's the latest unified command is SpaceCom. So, yeah. So here's a chart that, um, that kind of shows you where most of the bases are. The circles indicate how many and the size of them. And um, this chart was put together by a fellow named David Vine. He's a professor of anthropology at American University. Um, he's written two books about American military bases. The first one's called Base Nation. It kind of goes through oh, history, boy. Uh, history of of the bases and, and where they are. And then the United States of War, um, it, 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 it makes a point that not only is, um, are, are the bases uh, imperative to launching wars and, and, make, and facilitating wars and making them happen logistically by prepositioning troops and fuel and that kind of thing, but they're actually a cause of war. And he makes that point very clearly in his second book. I think it's, it's I think absolutely that's true. And that is why um, we believe at World Beyond War that if we can close these military bases, it will be a huge step towards peace and a huge easing of tensions. Uh, and uh, it just, it couldn't, it couldn't possibly do anything bad, <laughs> I think, towards peace if we got rid of these bases. It would be enormous help. So Indo-PACOM is uh, the area we're talking about tonight in regards to um, um, China. And it, it consists of these 36 countries that are in green. But I also want to bring people's attention to the point that it's not just the bases in the Pacific, uh, but probably more importantly to the military is the, 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 the naval operations, the naval, uh, the carrier strike groups. A carrier strike group is an aircraft carrier with uh, several support ships that defend the aircraft carrier. And those ships have cruise missiles. And the carrier has probably 40 or more uh, aircraft that have missiles on them. And there's also um, at least one submarine hanging out with the, with the carrier uh, strike groups. And so we keep them all the time roaming around uh, outside of um, China and, and Iran. And, and that's whenever the military wants to um, put their foot down or make a point, they move a carrier into place. And that puts everybody in fear. Is it as because these these carriers and the ships and the aircraft all carry hundreds of missiles uh, that are able to attack anywhere. So um, Japan is has the most American military people stationed on it than any other country in the world. Japan is not a very big country. Uh, Northern Island Hokkaido, and then you have um, Honshu. Tokyo is about here. Um, this is Shikoku and Kyushu. And way down here in the red, the, that's Okinawa. Now, there are about 90 bases on mainland. Uh, and bases is kind of an unclear word. A base uh, is, we're talking about facilities where American military people are. They're not all big bases, you know, with, with commissaries and, and housing and all that. Some are quite small, but we're using that word basis to talk about that. But, um, Okinawa, uh, which is very small, as you saw, and this is the, a, a chart of the main island of Okinawa. It has its own culture. It, they have their own language. It is not really, um, it's not equivalent to another island in, in, in Japan. It's not been treated that way by the Japanese or by, by other countries. So they're their own unique culture. Um, but they're also uh, treated as subordinate to, um, to Japan's government. And uh, that's why they get stuck, I think, with housing and, and hosting um, the U.S. military to such an extent that they do, because uh, the, the Japanese people don't want these bases there. And uh, so they, they put them someplace that uh, they can't fight back very well. 60%, um, so you see that how big Japan is, you see how tiny uh, uh, Okinawa is. 60% of the bases in Japan are here in Okinawa. 
even though Okinawa is only 6% of the whole land mass of Japan, and about 20% of Okinawa is taken up with American military. Now, the biggest, uh, big, big thing that's happening now with a lot of problems and a lot of pushback, a lot of resistance, is Hanoko. Um, a few years ago, uh, or so, maybe six or eight years ago, there was a, a Marine um, incident where a United States Marine uh, raped, uh, or three of them, I think, a 12-year-old girl, and it was huge, huge incident. Uh, these Marines were based at Futenma uh, Air Station uh, in a very crowded part of Hokkaido, of, uh, of, Ho not Hokkaido, of uh, Okinawa. And so the public was very, very outraged, as they should be. And so the solution they came up with was moving uh, those Marines to another part of Okinawa, which is obviously absurd. But that other place is Hanoko. And they are working on a project to dig and deepen the seabed um, so that it can support uh, a, a, a runway, an air, air facility. The problem is that the, uh, the seabed itself is described as soft as mayonnaise. Uh, it's very, very soft. It's impossible, almost impossible to build something on it. And so it's the, the cost overruns, it's been double what they thought it would take to spend. It's almost like $12 billion, uh, 12 years. Uh, and, and so it, not only do you have usual problems with another military base and you have the crime and you have all the pollution and toxic waste that we, 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 we uh, all of that, but, but this, this mayonnaise seabed may not ever allow them to build a thing. And once it's built, it may, uh, it may crumble to an earthquake because it sits on two fault lines. And so it's completely, uh, the, the population there very much against it, you know, protesting all the time. And uh, it's, still, it's still going ahead, but they're still protesting and there's still, we could still stop it. We just have to keep working on that. Um, South Korea has the second most number of American military personnel stationed on it. And most of them are at the DMZ line you'll see there. Um, about 25,000 troops. There has been recent uh, talk that the United States was to return 12 bases in, uh, in the northern part of South Korea. But that they are, uh, the sticking point is the cost of cleaning up all the environmental damage that, um, that the U.S. has caused, and the U.S. saying that they're not going to pay for it, and uh, and that's why that's a negotiation, and it's it's <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> um, Australia, Australia is a a, a very um, good relationship with the United States. Uh, they partner frequently. Um, the, Australia is uh, involved uh, to a good extent with a RIMPAC, which is the big multinational war game exercise in the Pacific Rim. Um, they have several facilities uh, around Australia. Um, but the good news is that there are uh, people pushing back. There's an International Peaceful Australian Network, or IPAN, that's been formed. Um, that has groups from all over the, the, that area. Um, in fact, a member of our um, board of directors, Liz Wimmerswall, uh, who lives in New Zealand, uh, actually was a, a, a focused speaker at uh, the IPAN conference in Australia. So we do have good connections with the uh, activist groups that are on the ground and uh, in their own countries. <laughs> The Philippines um, is no longer a big place for the United States military to work from, but uh, in 1904, Subic Bay was, was created, which is right in here, uh, and had been used heavily by the U.S. 7th Fleet for ship repairs and refueling, all that kind of thing. And then Clark Air Force Base uh, here in 1945, also massive base, had lots and lots of activity there. Um, but in 1991, um, the Philippine Senate rejected uh, the continuation of, uh, of basing rights and wanted to kick the U.S. out. Um, and so uh, it looked like that was going to happen. Um, and then Mount Minot uh, Mintatubo erupted, which uh, damaged, severely damaged both of the facilities. And that kind of facilitated the, uh, the return of American uh, troops back to the United States. But it kind of collapsed that uh, military infrastructure that we had in the Philippines. Now, right now, uh, they're operating under something called a uh, Visiting Forces Agreement. 
And that is a, a something between a, a naval um, a country's naval forces and the host country uh, agreements about what kinds of actions that the um, the Navy can do in the in the waters surrounding Philippines, and it, uh, for the United States to do their own uh, unilateral exercises, whatever. So the VFA, as long as it's in place, the United States doesn't have to go back to the Philippine government um, and ask permission to do these things. So it's important to the, the American uh, government to have it, but in um, this February in, in 2020, the the uh, the president of the Philippines, I know he's called the president, but whatever, uh, Rodrigo Duarte, um, said he wants him gone. He want, he wants the he wants to demolish the VFA too and 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 end it. He doesn't want to cater to the Americans in any way. Um, but a lot of people in the Philippine government disagreed with that, and especially they are especially worried about um, China's influence in the small islands um, uh, over in this area, the other side of the Philippines. Um, and so they put a lot of pressure uh, on, on him, I think. And so in uh, June of 20, uh, 20 this year, just a few months after that, they have now imposed a freeze on making that decision to um, dismantle the VFA. So right now we're the Americans have said, thank you, we're really happy that you're not going to uh, dissolve that and we want to work with you. And anyway, right now the VFA is still in effect, but we don't know what will happen with it. Guam and the Mariana Islands, um, just to mention here that um, the United States, the, all those Marines that, that, that Futma, uh, Futema, I can't pronounce the, the name, uh, um, Air, the Marine Air Base, um, they wanted to put them somewhere immediately, and Hanoko is going to be a few more years, so they moved a bunch of Marines to Guam, and uh, there's resistance there to more, more uh, troops there, but um, uh, Guam is considered a, a territory of the United States, so there's not a lot of pushback on that. Um, and the other really reprehensible thing that the United States has done in, in, in the past and still doing is creating live fire ranges on, on small islands um, that uh, hardly anybody live on. And, and then in some cases they have moved entire populations off their island somewhere else and they destroyed the, you know, the, the environment in the island and they have no place to go back to. Um, that's happened more than once. <clears throat> So uh, resistance, how can we get these bases closed? Um, I describe what I think of as an inside and an outside strategy. And the inside is, um, is working with uh, the Pentagon and Congress to try to find, uh, identify bases that uh, are maybe um, costing a lot or are maybe strategically redundant or no longer strategic or important or whatever, and kind of going to this inside the beltway idea. Um, there are people that are a member of this Overseas Base Realignment and Closure Coalition, or OBREC. It was formed by David Vine, I mentioned earlier. And it's a group of people. Um, I'm, uh, I represent World Beyond War on it. There are other veterans and, and professors and think tank people, uh, former uh, uh, representative congressman. And um, they have contacts uh, with, with the inner uh, sanctum of how, of how things happen in Washington. It was a big, big uh, eye-opener for me. But these people, uh, they know how to, to get something before a committee. They know how to lobby. Um, so that's the inside strategy. There's another group, uh, the Black Alliance uh, for Peace, uh, has a campaign to shut down AFRICOM. You saw AFRICOM was one of the six uh, areas. Um, and they are also kind of taking this inside strategy, uh, working with the Black uh, uh, Congressional Black Caucus uh, to, to work on this issue with, with a kind of an inside tactic as well. Now, the outside strategy is uh, working with uh, groups that are in country that already have their own activist groups and, and pressure points uh, identified and trying to support them as much as we can. And then um, World Beyond War is a charter member of the Coalition Against U.S. Foreign Military Bases and Code Pink and a, a whole bunch of other organizations are charter members of that as well. And we have had conferences. Uh, we have had uh, support actions for uh, for resistance in uh, Okinawa, especially, we have never that. And so, what is World Beyond War doing? Uh, what can we do, and what are we doing? We have um, members uh, in 188 countries around the world, and we are able to 
talk to all those people in all those places and facilitate networking. And we can tell all the people, you know, who, who live in uh, South Korea who are members about other uh, organizations or groups or people and hook them together and, and, and uh, you know, um, build, multiply the power that we have of by networking. So we, we have that capability. Um, education is a big thing. Uh, we just recently hosted a webinar uh, in conjunction with uh, Black Alliance for Peace and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom on AFRICOM and it was wonderful. Uh, it was a really great educational tool. Uh, we, we have uh, data uh, sheets, info sheets, uh, right now, we're getting ready to start a, a major research project of all the military bases. Um, we have uh, we have a guy that's is a uh, is going to take this on a professional research giant project that I don't know how to do. Um, and we're going to be able to use that research in the future to lobby and to make points with uh, Congress about uh, about what we found out. Uh, we can promote and support in-country resistance by, by letting people know about their activities. We put it on our website by writing articles about it. We can do petitions. We can coordinate uh, actions, um, uh, all kinds of things. And then uh, I, I am hoping, it is my dream, my vision, that um, World Beyond World will become the central hub of anything that is, um, uh, that is uh, against... Um, the, the foreign bases, that we will become the go-to place, that we have all the information, we have all the contacts, we have all the history and the facts, uh, we'll be known as the um, authority on closing U.S. foreign military bases. So I, uh, we're going to need all the help we can get. If you're interested in helping with anything uh, associated with the campaign, please let us know, and I will hook you right up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Leah. That was uh, very educational, and I hope that you'll uh, send me the PowerPoint and I can share it in a, in a summary sure thing. Uh, email mm -hmm. that I'll send out to attendees. Uh, that was wonderful. Okay, uh, I think Hania is going to introduce Molly now. Yeah. Last but not least, I'm going to introduce Molly Hurley, who is a former fellow with Beyond the Bomb, a grassroots organization working to prevent nuclear war, and now works for them as a fellowship associate. Uh, she helps guide the next generation of anti-nuclear activists. In addition, she is conducting her own independent research on nuclear weapons issues, as well as the role that art could play in building the movement for disarmament. She currently serves as a nuclear program fellow for the Prospect uh, Hill Foundation and will even travel to Japan next year to continue her work. Please take it away, Molly. Great, thank you. Um... Let's see, really quickly, would it be possible to show our presentation? Sure, sure. let me uh, just uh, make you a co-host. Perhaps while I'm finding your name here, you can uh, just explain some of the work that you've been doing. Um, sure, yeah. So um, with Beyond the Bomb, at least, uh, we're really focused on getting um, a diverse set of young people involved in the anti-nuclear movement and educating them on what's happening and giving them a sense of agency over this issue. And then the Prospect Hill Foundation, uh, I'm kind of focused on continuing my own personal education on uh, current nuclear issues and its history and everything. Um, let's see here. In addition to We're that, our host now, so you should be able. Okay, to. perfect. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's just jump right into uh, a little, a slight, just a very brief history of China and its nuclear program. To do that, let's get what it looks like today. Um, so this was from August 2020 by Arms Control Association. Um, Federation of American Scientists just put out this, uh, a new report on China, and they. Um, now I'll say that China has about 350 nuclear weapons, um, uh, with 270 of those being operational. Um, if you look at uh, reports from the Defense Department, uh, it is going to be a little bit lower. Um, that's because FAS also, and it looks like ACA also includes non-operational warheads. Um, What's really significant here is to notice that China has about 300, 350 nuclear warheads, while the US and Russia have about 6,000 or more. Um, so China's arsenal is about 1 20th the size of Russia and the US. Russia and the US own about over 90% of the world's total nuclear warheads. And then you can see the other seven countries and the approximate size of their arsenal. 
Um, just a really brief overview of China's nuclear program. Um, so they first decided to start developing nuclear weapons in 1955. In 1956, Mao gave a speech on nuclear weapons in which he referred to them as a paper tiger, which for a lot of Western listeners was very confusing. Um, like the just the idea of ever describing nuclear weapons as being sort of an empty threat uh, of made of paper and they're just like a scary tiger, but they're made of paper essentially. Um, and to under, and I guess I'll try to give a really brief contextualization, but the idea is that, um, especially uh, in under Mao, but still today too, I would say, uh, China looks more, essentially what Mao was trying to convey is the idea that it's people and their dedication to politics or ideology um, or like their the cause essentially their dedication to the revolution and the cause is what is going to win a war not some not a nuclear weapon or not any amount of technology but like the people's will is what is going to win a war um, and at the same time they view nuclear weapons as just being a form of political coercion um, and that um, perhaps, and especially now, um, other countries would hopefully dare not actually use a nuclear weapon due to all, all the different types of repercussions that there would be should a nuclear weapon ever get used again. Um, and now it's essentially just a tool for political coercion. Um, China referred to it as nuclear blackmail back in the day when they were getting pressure from both the Soviets and the US under their nuclear arsenal. Um, but anyway, so then in 1964, their development was successful. They tested uh, a nuclear weapon. And on the day that Mao announced uh, that they successfully tested a nuclear weapon, he immediately announced a policy of no first use in which China pledged to never use a nuclear weapon first in, an, um, in any sort of aggression or war or anything. Um, it, their nuclear weapons would be purely for retaliation. Um, and, in, and another uh, side to that is that they would also never use a nuclear weapon against a non-nuclear state. Um, let's see here. In the beginning, they had an idea of socialist proliferation, which was a belief in successful development of nuclear weapons. Um, or they had a belief that the successful development of nuclear weapons could inspire other post-colonial nations that successful development is possible. Um, the philosophy was abandoned later on and changed to a belief in and a commitment to eventual complete disarmament worldwide. Um, but kind of originally what China's plan was to try to replace the sense of terror surrounding nuclear weapons with a scientific understanding. Um, let's see here. Uh, pretty much since the get-go, China's policy has been one of minimum deterrence and uncertain retaliation. Um, so China, the details on, uh, on China's arsenal and philosophies and stuff like that are a little murky. Um, one of is because China does, is a semi-secretive country, but that's also semi on purpose too, in that, um, they want, because of that uncertain retaliation, um, such that if China were to be attacked, um, they are running a huge risk because they don't actually know where China's um, nukes are. A lot of their uh, nuclear weapons, their ground-based strategic, uh, their ground-based missiles and everything are mobile. They kind of just drive around the country and stuff like that. So they're harder to target. Um, and the and exact numbers and details and everything are a little bit murky as well um so that we can't pinpoint exactly china's nuclear capabilities um and so there's even more sweat of the uncertain retaliation that they might have um in 1980 they joined the conference on disarmament um so what's important to note is that the, the kind of the hallmark non-proliferation treaty the npt um was uh, open for signature in 1968 and entered into force in 1970. China did not join that. Um, and India and Pakistan still haven't joined that. North Korea withdrew from that. Um, the reason that India and Pakistan and even Israel never really signed on to it was the belief that the NPT created a type of nuclear apartheid such that there are the nuclear has and then there are the nuclear have nots. And that's kind of how China felt at first too. They didn't really like the superpower model that was uh, that we were um, trending towards at that time. They wanted a more multilateral world. So in 1980, they did join the Conference on Disarmament, which was created uh, with the explicit purpose of being a more multilateral environment for negotiations. 
Um, however, then in 1992, they did eventually sign on to the NPT. Um, part of this was from public pressure to join this. Um, and part of this was for a, uh, a, a show to their deep commitment uh, to nonproliferation and eventual disarmament. Um, uh, just kind of a, a show of good faith. Whether or not any of the nuclear armed states who are signed on to the MPT have actually been upholding their end of the bargain um, is like a whole other conversation. Um, but then in, um, let's see, I think, I think they're signing the MPT though is an example of China's ability to give in to social and community pressure for certain actions, uh, which runs counter the belief that China is immune to these types of pressures as a quote unquote non-democratic state, which is one argument against the treaty on the prohibition uh, of nuclear weapons right now that it's not going to do anything to China because China never listens to its people. And I think that is, um, I think that's misleading. Uh, kind of the same, along the same vein, in 1996, they joined the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which was an even bigger show of commitment to uh, the cause because China's nuclear weapons uh, came about 20 years after uh, the US's and then uh, Russia was much before then too. Uh, they were kind of out of the P5. They were one of the last ones to actually successfully get their nuclear weapons. And so then just like 30 years later, sign a treaty that they would not commit, uh, that they would not do any more nuclear testing um, is a big show of commitment because it means that by not doing nuclear tests, it would really limit the future development of their nuclear program. Um, and so I think that if they're signing uh, onto the NPT and CTBT are really um, significant points in history. Um, and then in 1995, they put out their first white paper, which is a formal document outlining nu their nuclear strategy. Um, the most recent one that came out was in 2019. Um, it's an open, it's a quote unquote open strategic challenge to the US, but one that does not have to lead to conflict. Basically, it characterizes their modernization and expansion as purely defensive. Um, the US and other major nuclear powers, both recognized and unrecognized, are also currently pursuing modernization. Um, and China's uh, characterizes it as being purely defensive, especially against the rising aggression from the US. And most importantly, it reiterates China's desire for a win for win win cooperations. Um, um, regarding disarmament and also just like in general diplomacy as well as a recommitment to their no first use policy. Um, so a quick look at understanding the problem today. First, we can look a little bit at New START, which is a new strategic arms reduction treaty, which is set to expire February 5th. Um, it's the last remaining arms treaty or nuclear arms control agreement between the US and Russia that Trump was not going to um, extend Biden has says that he will extend it. Uh, one big sticking point for Trump and why he didn't really want to extend it at first was because uh, he wanted to turn it into a trilateral deal between US, Russia and China. Um, however, if we go back to the beginning of my PowerPoint, um, this would have been a completely asymmetrical agreement uh, because China's arsenal is 1 20th the size of the US and Russia's. Um, so China was like, no way, we're not joining that. Um, and then they and then the State Department did use this as a tactic to um, further villainize and blame China for being uncooperative and everything. Um, um, let's see here. Uh, the, Trump has since dropped that. It doesn't look like news is going to get renewed before Trump leaves office. Uh, Biden has said that he will renew it. That's a whole like US Russia thing. Hopefully it does get renewed. Uh, but also moving on, I think what's significant is that from the beginning, China has always had a no first use policy and a commitment to this. And this is something, this is the central thing that Beyond the Bomb is currently working on, is getting a no first use policy from the US as well. And there is a House and Senate bill um, in Congress that we're trying to build, get co-sponsors on so that we can uh, put it on the floor for vote and everything. Um, China for years has been trying to encourage the other powers to adopt a policy of no first use. Um, it is a really good, important first step to more sane nuclear policy um, so that all of our fingers are finally off the nuclear trigger. Um, let's see here. Uh, one last thing. And then um, just looking at US hegemony, um, the US belief in requirement of nuclear weapons for sake of national security against external threats. Um, and I think um, Hun Lee touched on this a little bit too, but it's the idea that like 
the U.S. gets to keep its nuclear weapons to protect itself and its national security and like protect itself from external threats. And yet China and North Korea don't um, that like they they are too irresponsible for that kind of thing, possibly, or just a complete lack of acknowledgement of the hypocrisy or lack of understanding of like why China or North Korea might feel compelled to maintain their arsenals against um, U.S. aggression and everything. Um, and then, of course, there's a, this Orientalist belief if they feel that, like, Pakistan, India, China, or North Korea are too, because they're Eastern regimes, are too irresponsible or emotional or religious zealots or ideological zealots, whatever kind of mischaracterization to play, to make these people seem that they are less human than and less responsible or rational than U.S. Um, uh, leaders um, is just ridiculous, um, and I and that's uh, something that is really plaguing um, our current understanding of these Eastern regimes as well, including China. I think. Um, let's see here. Um, I think also something that's important to point out is that uh, U.S. nuclear weapons are on hair trigger alert, meaning that these could be. Uh, um, sent off and detonated at literally any moment within minutes. Um, as opposed to China, they actually keep their warheads separate from their delivery systems. Um, there are a few that they um, keep nearby in case they need to be installed quickly, but for the most part, um, I think that's uh, a really interesting point about China's nuclear arsenal um, that also reduces the risk of mistakes being made uh, because they're trying to make decisions too quickly, uh, which the U.S. is at risk of. Um, if word comes in that there's an incoming nuclear attack on the U.S., the president has approximately seven minutes to decide whether or not to launch a nuclear attack in response, and that's definitely not enough time uh, because because a lot of times that these um, that these have come in, they've been false alarms. We have had uh, numerous occasions throughout history since 1945 of false alarms coming in, and just like through sheer luck, uh, we did not start a nuclear war on accident. Um, let's hear. But that. Oh, and then also, sorry. If uh, any of you want to contact me or something, um, this is my Twitter as well as my email. If you're interested in uh, Beyond the Bomb, definitely check out our website. Um, if you want to join our fight to get a policy of no first use, we also do. Uh, we also we don't just focus on no first use, but uh, basic anti-nuclear, anti-war things such as defunding the Pentagon. Um, and getting new start pushed through and everything. And then the Prospect Hill Foundation, you can uh, see brief updates every now and then on my independent work and everything. Um, but anyways, that is all I have for now. So thank you. Thank you so much, Molly Hurley with Beyond the Bomb. So much information to digest and uh, such powerful speakers. I, I wanna thank our participants, Han Lee, David Swanson, Leah Bolger, Molly Hurley, Jody Evans, uh, it's phenomenal, the work that you're doing, and I appreciate all the posts in the chat, and I want to remind people to save the chat, and also ask you, we have 67 still with us, um, if you will join us for an action item now. Um, Medea is going to tell us about that. Well, I think maybe we should uh, allow the people who have to go to leave. Um, we're going to do this collective phone calling and see how it goes. And this is going to uh, senators leaving messages on their machines. Um, but we do want to uh, say to those of you who came, and I know it's late, it's been almost an hour and a half, packed full of fantastic information. I feel like I want to go and listen to everything all over again. Um, so to uh, echo uh, Marcy and saying thank you so much for those great presentations. And we will be uh, meeting every week. So we will be letting you know about the next one. Uh, and um, Marcy, anything be for those people have to leave? Anything you want to add or honey? No, I just that I, I have recorded this on my computer. Hopefully it's work, working out. And um, I can send it to Code Pink to have Code Pink upload it to their site or to YouTube. And I'll let you know about that um, where you can see it. Uh, I do urge you to save the chat. There's a lot of excellent information and links if you want to get further involved. And uh, can you tell people how to save the chat in case they don't know? Sure, yeah. Where it says at the bottom of the chat, it says two, and then it says file, and then there are three dots. If you click on the three dots, it'll say save chat. So save chat there. 